All right, welcome back to Pastor's Corner. We, these are conversations to help you follow Jesus. And this season, we've been talking about the different elements of our Sunday morning gatherings and just wanting to explain the pieces of these things and a little bit of our take on it and, and the unique culture that we have here uh, at LBC. And one of the things that gets celebrated uh, periodically in the life of our church, which historically has been celebrated for centuries, is something called sacraments baptism, the Lord's Supper. Uh, it also goes by the name of ordinances. And these things churches have just been doing really since the very beginning, baptizing people and sharing the Lord's Supper together. So let's just open up the floor here for a, a brief explanation of these two things. Maybe one of you want to take uh, baptism and well, explain I it briefly. Maybe just start with why are these important in yeah. general, right? Yeah. Uh, I think bottom line is there are certain things that true churches just do mm -hmm. right and i think ordinances or or the sacraments of baptism and the lord's supper are things that all churches should be doing no matter what place what time what the cultural circumstances they are in these are marks of true churches mm -hmm. and so it's important for us to do these things yeah right and so that's why doing this segment is important so people understand these are not just rituals right these have deep meaning mm -hmm. and they've been instituted in scripture by christ for his church that's why we do them mm -hmm. yeah yeah so maybe I'll start with baptism uh, being the, uh, <laughs> the first mark. I mean, Christians have been b being that baptized since the beginning. Jesus commanded that in the making of disciples, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? And it's promised to be with them always, even to the end of the age. And so baptism is commanded by Christ as part of the disciple-making process that, you know, someone commits to follow Jesus to make him the Lord and Savior of their life. They, they get baptized uh, in this process. Process. In other words, it's a public identifying with being a follower of Jesus. And so Christians from the beginning, that was the first mark uh, of what it meant to actually be a Christian, mm -hmm. right? Was that you are actually baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? So does baptism save you then? No. No, right. baptism doesn't doesn't save you uh, because that's not what Jesus said it is. It's a it's an identifier, mm -hmm. right, uh, mm -hmm. with Christ. So it's a it's a visible sign. Um, however, I think at the same time, when when we read the scriptures in the New Testament, it's really inconceivable that someone could call themselves by the name of a Christian without identifying with the name of Christ through the symbol of baptism. So I think the most helpful way I've always heard it described is that it's an outward sign of an inward reality. Mm -hmm. it, it outwardly represents what has spiritually taken place in the life of a person when they've placed their faith and trust in Jesus. Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I like that about, you know, it's <clears throat> inconceivable to think of, mm -hmm. uh, of a Christian not being identified with Christ through baptism. And I think that's by design for the Lord. It's, it's almost as if you do this first step of obedience as as a training or or an introduction to this is what it means to follow mm -hmm. Christ. It means to be following in obedience to what He's commanding us. Mm -hmm. Right? You, you mentioned it in, in the Great Commission that we are to teach people to follow the commands of Christ, and He's given us this very simple, very clear first step. In in essence, mm -hmm. is follow me in to the waters of baptism mm -hmm. for this outward sign of what's happened to you inwardly. And so I, I think it's a really great experience for Christians to do, not that they're going to receive anything new, certainly not salvation from the Lord, but it's a first step in a life that's marked by following Christ in obedience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and there's definitely, you know, a lot more that can go into baptism. Maybe we can take some of those questions kind of more towards the end, but, you know, just kind of giving this this little overview of what's going on here, let's turn our attention towards the other practice that we do. And, and so baptism kind of comes up, you know, as people are saved and we're discipling them and and they're moved in obedience, we'll schedule a baptism and we'll have it during the service, but so, so that kind of happens, you know, as uh, as needed in a sense with people. But 
then we have this other practice which is the lord's supper or communion and that happens pretty regularly we celebrate that the first sunday of every month right. and so what's going on with the lord's supper why do we carve out time every month to do this practice together I think, well, similar to baptism, it contains this, uh, this symbolism about what's really happening in, in the Christian life and what Christ has done for us. And so I think the most simple understanding for me is it is a ritual of remembrance. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's much more than that, obviously. You, know, you can look at the history of, of the, uh, the doctrines around baptism and how much conflict there's been in that and continues to be around it. But whatever else um, you may or may not think about the Lord's Supper— Bottom line, it is a time where, as a community, we gather together to remember the essence of our faith, that our, that our God came into this world and died in our place and took the punishment for us. And it's like a reset that happens for us monthly. It's just mm -hmm. a reset to remember, this is what's true. Mm -hmm. This is what's true. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think... <clears throat> I mean, as well as along with, with baptism, both of these signs make visible the gospel, right? Yeah. Like, so so baptism, you're recognizing I'm buried with Christ. My sin died with him in, uh, you know, on the cross, right? But I'm being raised to newness of life, from 6, 3, and 4, right? But in, in, in the Lord's Supper, yes, Christ commands that we do this in remembrance of him. But he, you know, we read uh, in 1 Corinthians that this is representative of this. This is the body of Christ that's broken for me, right? This is the blood of Christ that's shed for me. Um, and when we do this, we're remembering, we're rehearsing to ourselves the, the, the true story of the gospel, that what's been, what's been done for us in Christ is complete. It's sufficient for our salvation, our life in Christ. But it also, you know, we, we, it says that, you know, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, right? And so, like, we're, we're telling one another and ourselves this gospel story that, that Christ is coming again to make mm -hmm. all things new, right? Um, which includes us as the people of God. Um, and so I, I just think it's uh, it's really a helpful way because it's a, it's a physical marker, something that I, I touch and taste that reminds me of the truth of that my faith has, has substance and that substance is Christ himself. Yeah, I, th there's something very tangible about it and, and you know, the elements themselves that you actually hold them, you actually take them in and we do that together and i think that's one of the uh, you know that's i think why sometimes it's called communion as opposed to the lord's supper because it's done together mm -hmm. and we're all taking this same step of remembrance together at the same time it's just something really powerful about mm -hmm. about doing that in the gathered service and so I, I think it i think it's hugely important and i think it's more than just simple remembers you know you talked about mm -hmm. it's also a look forward mm -hmm. right we're looking back on what christ has done we're looking forward to what he will do in his return and we're looking to the moment to remember the fact that he is right here with us and there's something about uh, the Lord's Supper and celebrating it that brings the nearness and the reality of Christ's presence mm -hmm. into focus, right? right? I don't want to get you know hyper spiritual over it, but there's something about um, His presence in that celebration that's real mm -hmm. and that's tangible, mm -hmm. and clearly that's a powerful experience for 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 Christians to do again on on a regular rhythm yeah. of, mm -hmm. of life. Right. Yeah, I think it's important while there's the 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 personal experience that you have in that, right? It's being done in a public reality, yeah. right? These are the, these things that the norm for them that's assumed in scripture is that these are taking place in the gathering of believers, right? right. Like communion is not just something you do individually at, at your home, right? Or baptism isn't just something that you do, you know, alone with, with one other person, mm -hmm. right? I mean, even though we have the, ex I think the exception of the Ethiopian eunuch, there, there's no church established at that point, you know, in the scriptures, but, but I think the assumption throughout the New Testament is both of these ordinances are being practiced in the community of believers, right? As you said at the beginning, it's part of what makes a church a church. These right. are things that churches do, right? And so these are things that Christians who belong to the church participate in as they're practiced in the context of the local church gathered, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why this is such an important part of our of our gatherings, mm -hmm. why we do them in our gatherings, you know, not outside of them and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. Yeah. Yeah, so I think as our culture you know, moves to be more post-Christian and, and people are just maybe less familiar with church and what goes on there, it does still seem that in this area, people 
know something about communion. And there's people that I've talked to who don't really attend church or go to church consistently, and they'll still carve out time uh, in their life to bring their kids to a first communion or attend something like that with their families. And so there seems to be just doing the practice seems to be important to some, you know, people in this area. So Dan, when you think about it, you know, is communion sort of like a, a talisman that you can just do the act and it's producing something in us? And and and, and so why, like what what's going on there with that? Is is just doing the act what it's all about? No, it's 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 it has to be connected to faith, right? Mm-hmm. You know, so like there, there's nothing inherently or intrinsically valuable about the particular wafer and particular juice that's there, right? It's what it represents through the word of what the word of God tells us it is, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so, like, if you don't believe that to be true, then it does nothing for you. In, in fact, actually, Scripture forbids taking the Lord's Supper in an unworthy in an unworthy manner, right? So knowing that neither of these things save us, there's no spiritual, you know, unique grace that's imparted to you in that just by virtue of taking it in and of itself, it's connected to what God's word says that it is. And so um, its significance then, I guess, is experienced by way of faith, right? Not by way of just mere practice. And so I think it's actually dangerous to actually partake in that uh, unthinkingly, unknowingly, mm-hmm. unaware of what it is, um, and uh, and hoping that it brings some sort of you know kind of spiritual blessing to you. That blessing comes to you in Christ, and this is a reminder mm-hmm. of what that reality actually is. And, and I think that's why historically there's been a resistance, and certainly in evangelical circles, of leaning toward the word ordinance as opposed to sacrament. Because if you lean too far into this idea of sacrament, that is some, a channel of God's blessing, then you can then you can quickly get into a place, well, well if I just do it, then I get it. Mm-hmm. Right? Then I get this right. blessing. And I think people still have that mindset, mm-hmm. um, especially coming out of certain backgrounds, religious backgrounds. They think it's just the act of doing it will get me this blessing from God. And, and really this, uh, I, I think, an extreme view of what sacrament means. Yes, there is a blessing in doing it. Um, there is a blessing in the ritual, the reminder of it, the community aspect of it. Um, it is true. So it is a sacrament in that regard, but it's not a simple, well, just do this and you get blessed. And so you can live your life any way you want right. in disobedience to the Lord everywhere else. But for once, I'll go do this and then it's going to somehow make things right. And, and it doesn't. And Dan, you brought up that uh, First Corinthians passage that, that gives a pretty stern warning mm-hmm. about it. You know, and, and it talks about examining yourself before you partake. And there's been a historical misunderstanding, I think, in understanding that passage, mm-hmm. thinking that means I have to deal with all my sins before I do that. And for me, that just strikes a contrary note to what you're celebrating. Mm-hmm. Christ did it for me, mm-hmm. so I don't need to get myself ready by confessing every known sin so that I'm worthy to receive this. Right. I'm not worthy to receive it. But what it does speak to, and if you read the context of that passage, it speaks to thinking too lightly of what this thing represents, of what this meal represents, and doing it contrary to the community that it's representing. Right, right. That's really what it's getting at. So examine yourself in terms of, am I understanding what I'm doing mm-hmm. here? Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Am I understanding what the Lord has done for me here, what it means to the unity of the church? Right, right. That's what it's getting at. Yeah, am I genuinely a believer? Yes. Right? Am I genuinely part of... The, the body of believers because I put my faith in Christ and I'm banking on his work on mm-hmm. my behalf, right? Yeah. 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 And so that I think raises another question about communion, which is sometimes uh, we when we're gathered together, we have adults in the assembly and we would say, yeah, if you're a believer in Christ, come partake in this meal. You don't necessarily need to be a member at our church, but if you have believed in Christ or maybe you're a member elsewhere, please partake. Uh, But sometimes we also have children Mm -hmm. sitting amongst us Mm -hmm. and knowing their spiritual status, we may not know whether have they accepted Christ or not yet. And, And so, you know, Dan, do you think that children should be taking communion? Yeah, I think that this is always just a little bit hard because this is like a wisdom, like imprudence sort of issue because scripture is just not clear 
about this specifically, right? Um, but I think when we think about the, the principles of Scripture of what are these sort of memorials supposed to do, right? All the way back to the Old Testament, you know, things like the Passover ceremony provided context for parents to teach their children what this is, you know? Um, and so as, as a matter of personal conviction, um, not necessarily representative of what the whole church believes, I don't think that children, particularly children who are not, have not professed faith in Christ, ought to take, ought to take the Lord's Supper. I think that produces confusion right. and, and, and uncertainty around that and contributes to, to, to more, uh, more misinformation and, and misunderstanding about what the Lord's Supper actually is. Um, and in fact, I think personally, this is, just, this is more descriptive than prescriptive, but, but I think that in terms of wisdom, this makes a lot of sense, but I wouldn't permit my own children to take the Lord's Supper until they've been baptized, because I think that the, the symbols go together, right? It's like, you know, I, you know, just like a wedding ring, you know, if that's what baptism is, you're putting on the outward symbol of your commitment and allegiance to Christ to, to kind of take part of the other blessings without that means I don't think you really understand the gospel sufficiently enough and maturely enough to be able to be baptized at this point, you know? And so, um, so I think that in general, um, you know, at least parents ought to exercise a certain level of care and caution, right, about how they do that, whether they share that same conviction around baptism and the Lord's Supper or not. We're certainly not binding anyone's conscience around that. Um, but certainly the conviction ought to be, I need to know that my children have placed their faith and trust in Christ and, and yep. I have confidence that they're actually regenerate believers because this is for Christians. Right. And it's a helpful distinction and opportunities to share the gospel with your children to, to be clear is, no, this is not for you because you're not yet a believer in Jesus, and this is how you can become one, right? So every time that we take the, the supper and pass it by, there's an opportunity now to share the gospel again right. as children ask questions, and we ought to be prepared for that as parents. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think there's something about raising that continual awareness in the mind of a child. You know, So every month as communion is passed around, or I guess we don't pass it around anymore, but as mm -hmm. communion is, is celebrated among us, it's a reminder in the, in, to the child that that's how they've been taught is this is important. Right. And I need to think about this. This is important. I need to ask questions about this. And opportunities and reminders for the parents for the same thing. This is important. I need to share with my child right. what this is all about. So mm -hmm. it's it's a great opportunity right. for those kinds of things. And, and we ought to we ought not to shirk away from that or shy away from that opportunity, you know, because each of those opportunities is an opportunity to share mm -hmm. and to talk about the gospel yeah. with our children, you know, and uh, we don't want to be kind of cavalier about how we do it or, or uh, unthinking, you know, uh, because it is it's serious to Christ, and yeah. so it should be serious to us. Yes. Right. Yeah. So communion and and issues around the Lord's Supper affect children, and that also uh, I think baptism as well, because historically many many churches have practiced something called infant baptism. Mm -hmm. um, that is something that we don't do here. We practice believer's baptism, and so we call people to believe in Christ and make that profession of faith and essentially say, I'm all in with Christ and, um, and uh, you know, following him and being obedient to him. And so uh, an infant, we would say, can't express that level of faith at that time. And yet we kind of have a unique position on infant baptism as well because uh, in some cases we'll allow people into membership who have been baptized as infants uh, in certain cases. So can you just talk through infant baptism a little bit, Dennis? I know that you have you know background in that from, right. from your history and just talk around some of those issues which can just be a little confusing sometimes. Yeah, so I guess there's two main um, um, understandings about baptism. Um, within uh, the, the Christian community, um, well-respected theologians on both sides of the issue, right? And, and for us, we come down on the believer's baptism issue, which means it's a step taken by a believer after a conscious acceptance of the Lord. It's, it's a symbol of entrance into mm -hmm. the kingdom, so, so to speak. But there is a more of a Reformed position on it, which, which views it more in line with, with, a, with a symbol of a covenant. And so it's, it's mm -hmm. speaking to being under the protection of the church. And so a child of a believer would go through the baptism process um, as, as a statement of not salvation, 
but they're under the protection of the Lord in this covenant community of, of believers. And we respect that position. We don't hold that position as a church. We don't teach that position as a church, and we certainly don't practice it. But if you come to us as an adult who has been baptized under that tradition, um, we're not going to make you get rebaptized, right? And, and so, so I think we're uh, we're willing to be open about that rather than trying to be dogmatic and, and putting up fences that right. uh, that don't necessarily need to be there. Right. So I think that's a tradition, this reformed tradition of being under kind of the protection of the covenant. Right. We respect. We would say, okay, God. Scripture has given us freedom mm-hmm. in, in, in kind of the way we conceive of putting right. these things together for that view. And yet, I think we would also say there are some other views of infant baptism which uh, are out of bounds of Scripture. Right. And I'm thinking of those that would encourage, like, this is wiping away original sin and really integral to the salvation experience of a mm-hmm. person. And so in that case, if someone came to us and had been baptized as an infant in that tradition, we would ask them to be baptized here as a yes. believer. No, that's absolutely right. And because that gets it, you know, I guess the question is in the broad category of essential versus non-essential mm-hmm. doctrine, right? And what we try to do, and if you read our statement of faith, that's, that's really what it's getting at is these are the essentials of the Christian faith. And basically it's this is the gospel spelled out in a couple different categories right and so when you're when you're holding a position on any topic and and in this case it would be baptism that is that is impinging on what the gospel is really saying, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And this idea of wiping away original sin, this idea of it's the first step in salvation for an infant, that's impinging on the gospel. And that we need to draw a sharp line. Mm -hmm. And, And we do. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think, you know, as we've said, we baptize believers Mm -hmm. and our typical practice is to uh, put them under the water in kind of like a big bathtub and bring them out symbolizing dying with Christ and being risen with Christ. But But I think, you know, when people are sitting in the pews and they're seeing that, and maybe they're they're Christians, but they're not baptized yet. They kind of may feel some guilt because they know the sin that's in their life mm-hmm. still, even though they are Christians. And they may think like, yeah, I, I just need to be like ready to be baptized. Mm-hmm. And so what would you say to that person who is who's made a profession of faith in, in Christ, but they just don't feel ready yet to take that step of baptism? Get baptized. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's no... The, like. There is no condemnation for those of us who are in Christ Jesus. And so if you put your faith in Christ, you're in Christ and you have been baptized into him, right, by way of the Holy Spirit. Like that's that's been true of you. So uh, I would encourage that person to not disbelieve God's promises towards them, right, and actually take a step of obedience to to, to, to identify with Christ, to do physically what you've already has already true of you mm-hmm. spiritually, mm-hmm. and throw away all of the, the the kind of guilty conscience. Christ died to, to, to cleanse you. Hebrews tells us from a, from a guilty conscience, and so so that's at the at the core of it. It's just unbelief and spiritual pride to think that I need to be some sort of spiritually ready or that mm-hmm. it's this mark of maturity because there's no precedence at all for that in Scripture. Somehow that's kind of worked its way, I think, into a lot of evangelicalism in churches is similar with the Lord's Supper. We have to kind of get ourselves, you know, pious enough or ready enough. And I think that kind of, um, uh, I think it kind of muddies and distorts the the beauty of the sign mm-hmm. of baptism, you know. And, and, you know, like I think, you know, like I got baptized when I was an, an older child, a preteen. And, and I think that there's times when I was, oh, man, I wish I really understood even more of that. Right. But that's the beauty of why you're committed in the church, because every time someone's baptized, that's my baptism, mm-hmm. right? It's 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 a reminder of that's what's true of me. That happened to me. And so whether you feel ready or not, every time you see someone baptized, you know, in the in the context of the church, it's a reminder of what's true of, of you spiritually speaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So don't delay. Right. Just do it. Yeah, just, just do, do it. it. Yeah. So church, I hope this has been helpful for you. And really the most important point about baptism and about the Lord's Supper or communion is what they are pointing us to. Not really even what, but who, which is Christ. He is the point of these things. He is why we are doing these things. And so I just want to encourage you, like Dan was just talking about, If you profess Christ, if you say, yes, I've 
I trust in him for salvation. God has rescued me, but you haven't been baptized. Don't delay in that. We have baptism services periodically, but always feel free to reach out, email us, or or talk to us on Sunday and say, I want to be baptized, and we'll begin walking with you on that journey. There's a little bit of a process to get you ready for that, but we'll walk with you on that journey. And also, too, I hope that this just adds meaning and significance to our times together when we're having the Lord's Supper, understanding that this is a family meal where we are communing with one another and communing with our risen Lord. Christ. And so we long to gather together with you, and we hope that these things can be encouraging to you. Thanks for tuning in today.